I'd like to welcome everybody to the Prosperity People and Planet um, virtual open day. Thank you for joining us. And I know you all are probably all over the world. So thank you for joining us in your various um, time zones. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're coming from. I'm very excited about this new master's program that we're launching in September, 2023. Um, it's a master's program that was designed to be innovative um, and to be a bit sort of different and have a different mentality. It's the idea with it is to very much focus on solutions and some of the solutions that are um, out there, not just focus on the problems. So let me give you a quick overview of some of the frameworks and some of the things we will cover in this master's program. Um, and then you'll hear from Robert Costanza, Professor Robert Costanza, who will be co-leading the master's program with me. Um, Lydia Martin, who is a student of ours at the moment. Um, Duck, Dun Duncan McLean, sorry. Um, and um, to talk, give you a bit more information about what to do, how to do it, et cetera. Okay, um, and I believe there's, you can put in questions, any questions you have in Q&A, and Amanda will keep track, and we can chat about those later. So let me share my screen. Um, so a big part of um, what we try to get through with this master's is the fact that we live in a whole system that's integrated, that you can't separate the economy, society, environment, us and the, race, the rest of nature, basically, from each other. They're all interdependent and they're all embedded in each other. It's not that you have economy sitting next to the environment or next to society, they're all in it together. So if you have a problem, it's probably a problem from different, that impacts different areas. If you have a solution, you have to consider the whole solution as a whole within all three of these. For example, climate change is a symptom of a larger economic and societal problem. It's not the problem in itself. And so how do we look for solutions that then take the whole system into account? And a lot of what we look at is what is our goal um, of society? Is it to grow GDP or is it things like to um, have sustainable human well-being? And if we do have sustainable human well-being, what contributes to, to that? It can't just be environment, natural capital. It has to be a combination of the built capital, human capital, and social capital, and the way they interact together to then contribute to sustainable human well-being. They can't, and none of those can do it independently. Um, and we look at ecosystem services, and basically it's how the environment um, contributes to our well-being, um, how we benefit from environment in various ways. So we can look at, you know, we get food, raw material, medical resources, fresh water from the environment, but there's a lot of things that the environment does for us that we never see directly. So it regulates our air quality. It regulates our climate and water and erosion. Um, it there's photosynthesis, which grows our plants, um, soil formation, and then we enjoy the environment through aesthetic values, spiritually and religiously, um, recreation. So there's a lot of things that go into um, our well-being that we might never detect, but are very important. We talk about the planetary boundaries and the basically Kate Rayworth's um, donut. Um, and so the idea is, can we stay within 
environmental, ecological ceiling, um, identified some of the key issues, um, but then also make sure that nobody touches the floor, that everybody is taken care of, that um, nobody is left behind. Um, and so how do we deal with those two aspects? How do we make sure that people are within this circle and everybody is within the circle um, and nobody is kind of falling um, into the middle black hole. Um, so we kind of talk about that bigger picture as well. And all of you have probably heard of the SDGs. Um, and so how do they, for example, relate to all this? How do we work, them, work with them? How does the UN measure them and look at them? How then are they split up into the economy, society, and biosphere? Um, how can we manage all of these, including all the other frameworks? So whether it's SDGs that we're looking at or the DONA economy or planetary boundaries, these are frameworks that we use to just look at the whole system. Some are better than others. Some work where better um, in certain situations than others. And how can we determine which one we should use? And we know that there are these tipping points all over the world, um, whether it's um, the boreal forest disappearing or whether it's the Amazon rainforest disappearing, the Great Barrier Reef um, and other coral reefs, um, the Indian mon summer monsoons changing. How will that in fact impact not just the environment and the planet around us, but also our society? also our economy, because all these will be impacted significantly. So then we start trying to put it all together, specifically looking at from a lot of it from the environmental side and saying how it's all impacted. OK, um, when we talk about measuring well-being, there are various indicators out there that we can use to measure whether it's welfare sustainable um, well-being, whether it's progress, there's a lot of terms prosperity that we can use um, for this. Um, one of those indicators is the genuine progress indicator, the GPI. And we see that if we compare GDP and GPI globally, we see that GPI kind of levels off around 1978-ish and GDP keeps growing. And a lot of this sort of difference, the leveling off happens because of the cost of inequality within society and because of environmental degradation. So for example, if there's a cyclone, hurricane, typhoon, same thing, different words, but if there's a big storm, destroys a lot of buildings, GDP grows because there has to be a lot of regrowth and rebuilding. If there's disease, a new disease that happens, there's a lot of money that goes into it to find a cure, to build equipment, to help diagnose, et cetera. GDP grows. If there's an oil spill, there's a lot of cleanup. A lot of GDP has to go in for the cleanup to happen. But nobody would say that those things are actually positive. And so this is what they're, we're saying is that GDP, the growth in GDP here, a, a lot of times has been because of those neg negative aspects. And so if we look at actual welfare, it has leveled off. It's not going up. And so we look at trends as well. Um, let's go. And so this is what Herman Daly has called economic growth and uneconomic growth. Economic growth is when the economy is growing in a positive way. An uneconomic growth is although GDP is rising, it's not actually economic anymore because it's negative to us. Um, we also look at what this means for the world as a whole. So um, one of the kind of methodologies, processes that we use is through scenario planning. It's creating future scenarios and looking at how society would look like in those various scenarios. So what if, for example, we did focus on GDP. Oh, sorry. Go back one. 
transitions. If we focused on GDP um, and on the individual, what would the world look like? And this is one scenario we designed that's around, we called market forces, where the market is the priority. GDP is the priority. What if we focused on um, GDP growth, but at the community level? What would that look like? Policy reforms and talk about the details. Fortress world. So what if we focus on individualism, but then focus on prosperity? Do we look at prosperity of just very specific individuals or the whole community? And then what if we look at prosperity and the community? What does that mean? And so with these scenarios, we can then say, if we design these scenarios, which one do we want? And how do we want to get there? How do we make the world this way? Because the best way to predict the future is to actually create it, to build it. And so if we say we want to go towards great transition or we want to go towards policy reform, what are the steps we have to then take to get to that future scenario? Um, this is a cartoon that um, I really like, and I know a lot of us use it, but it's the idea of this presenter saying, you know, we're going to have energy independence, um, preserve the rainforest, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water, air, healthy children, et cetera, et cetera. And this guy in back is saying, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Let's just create a better world and everything else will fall into place. Um, so in this program, it is led by myself and Professor Robert Costanza. Um, so you'll be see, would be seeing a lot of us. And the goal with this program basically is that it introduces students to a range of conceptual discussions like complex systems change. Um, it looks at the interaction between economic, social, political, ecological process. Um, we use different methodologies um, about measuring, modeling diff these different connections. Um, Bob, can you mute yourself for a second? Because I'm getting echoes from you. Thank you. Um, so we use various methodologies to kind of go into um, into how that looks, how we take the whole system into account when making decisions, especially. Um, and then how do we basically create new information and knowledge that makes a difference? And Bob can tell you about one of the courses we're running this term, um, where we're working with students to actually do just that and what we would do in the future um, around workshop courses working with communities. So, um, and Bob will tell you more details about that. So the way the program is set up is that it'll be in three terms. So it's a 11 month program. The first term you take um, a basically conceptual frameworks course to sh give you an overview of what's out there, what we'll be talking about. Um, we'll talk about um, prosperous, inclusive planetary futures. So we'll talk about scenarios, developing scenarios. How do you create sort of future um, future ideas, future um, decisions, future goals. Um, and then you'll take an optional module. Um, second term, you'll do research methods. Um, so it's a bit more focused on how do we actually do this? And then atelier, which is a workshop course where we'll be working with a community to solve problems um, with them. And Bob will talk much more with that and tell you about the course we're running like this, this term. And then you'll take another optional module. You'll start talking about your dissertation probably even a bit sooner, probably sometime in term one, and really get into it um, term two, start making decisions about what your research will be, how you'll do it, um, your methodologies, what potential results you'll get, et cetera. Um, and really spend term three um, and the final six months, five, six months of your um, degree focusing on the dissertation with a supervisor that can lead you through that process. 
Um, and then what can you do once you graduate? Um, so students that graduate will be able to do a lot, basically a lot of different things because what this program teaches you is how to think differently about the world. It teaches you how to go into any job and say, hold on, we're actually missing a big component. Hold on, this is a bigger perspective that we need to consider. Um, it'll teach you about um, personal leadership, professional skills training, that we there's sessions that are run um, specifically looking at that. Um, we'll look at you'll be doing a lot of writing. So you'll pick up writing skills, communication skills that you can use um, in the future. You'll be doing a lot of group work. So you'll learn how to collaborate with your peers and with the community. Um, and you'll basically look at what opportunities are out there. You'll meet a lot of people. There's talks at the IGP all the time. You'll get to meet a lot of interesting people, make connections, work with community members to then be able to go out to the next step and say, hey, I'm really interested in this. I know people in this area. Let's see if I can find a job. So that's the goal of the program. Um, and then here's some useful links, but... Thanks for listening, um, and I'll hand it over to Bob to talk about some of the specifics. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Ida. Um, Ida mentioned uh, these uh, workshop-based or atelier courses, and I think will be one component of the of the degree that we're talking about. And I think it's a different approach to. Um, to education that's more learning by doing um, and uh, learning some of the skills I think you'll need in the in the real world. Uh, so uh, the idea there is that we'll pick a problem uh, every term. Uh, it will be different every term. Uh, and in collaboration with the stakeholders around that problem, uh, we'll try to come up with a solution as a, as a group. Uh, as a class. Um, one example I can um, <clears throat> tell you about is what we're doing this term. Um, here's, the, here's our mascot puppy. He just showed up. <laughs> <clears throat> um, you, we, one of the things that we're, one of the big problems I think we have uh, today is the um, sort of over-reliance on GDP as a measure of progress. Um, the GDP was never designed as a measure of progress. I had showed some um, the graph of GDP versus genuine progress. Uh, so we know that um, you know it's not the right indicator. Um, but uh, and there there have been literally hundreds of alternatives proposed at different at different scales. The IGP itself has worked on um, prosperity indices at the community scale. Uh, but I think one of the problems is that there is so much diversity. Uh, that, that there, there are these hundreds of different indicators and no real consensus about that. So what we decided to do in this class uh, was to get the class to work together and do a systematic survey uh, of, the, of the literature and other sources uh, to see, well, how many of these indicators are there really out there and, and how different are they? Uh, so that's what we've been working on. We came up with a list of 350 different uh, well-being indicators of, of some kind at some scale. And now we're working on a database uh, that can analyze that and say, well, what are the similarities and differences? You know, are they, are they really all that different? Uh, or is there some overarching similarities that we can, that we can draw on? And, um, and we'll publish an academic paper as a class. So all of the class, the class participants will be co-authors on this, on this paper. And, and um, I think that will have a, a significant uh, input into this ongoing process of how do we how do we build the consensus for uh, an alternative to GDP, which I think has to uh, has to have that broader uh, consensus backing it up. So <clears throat> that's just what we were doing this this term. Um, in previous terms at other universities, we've done similar kinds of courses. Uh, we did one where we uh, created a a survey of the Australian population of alternative alternative future scenarios, the four futures that, that, Ida, that Ida pointed to. 
we did versions of those for Australia. We, uh, we actually had a, a, a representative sample of the Australian population. And we sent out a survey where people could read about those different alternative futures and rank them and tell us why they, uh, why they did or didn't like them. And we published that as an, as an academic article. And I think for this program, uh, we also talked about the scenario planning uh, uh, sort of module. And I think that that's, that's a, a really essential um, element in overcoming our addiction to this uh, GDP growth at all costs, you know, economic paradigm. I think that's really part of what's at the, the root of our, our current inability to, to make the kinds of transform, transformative changes that, that, uh, that we really need to create this sustainable and desirable future. And so part of that therapy is to build a, a shared vision of the kind of world that, that we really want. So how do we do that? <clears throat> uh, what are some new and innovative ways of engaging the larger population uh, in thinking about alternative futures and which kind, what kind of world uh, we all really want? So I think that, can, that would be a, a, a significant part of the program as well. Um, I don't know. It's probably it's probably enough for me, uh, and we can open it now for uh, for questions. No, not yet. Not yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Bob. <laughs> um, Lydia, would you like to tell us a bit about your experience? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lydia. So I am a part-time student, actually, within the IGP. Um, so this is my second and final final year. Um, I come from a background of, well, quite kind of multi-industry. Um, I worked in film for a while and fashion. Um, I worked in tech startups um, and even oil and gas. Um, and the one kind of connecting thread was all about sustainability and really, I was really, really passionate about how to introduce sustainable change across all of these industries. Um, and so ended up at the IGP, I was looking for a master's degree um, and IGP really hit for me what I was looking for in terms of the relationship between theoretical and practical, um, you know, education and knowledge, um, and IGP was was innovative, new, um, and and really kind of ticked all my boxes. So that's kind of why I'm here. I'm from the states originally, from um, New York, but I've been in London for quite a few years. Um, so my experience at the IGP has been really, really amazing, really dynamic. Um, I would say that one of my favorite things and which you will probably find and which I can see on like everybody coming in and where they're from, um, the kind of breadth and location and heritage and diversity of the student body is really amazing. And that leads to usually very interesting um, conversations in the classroom. And, you know, for me, when you're kind of developing your critical thinking, which which this course is so um, brilliant at, it's really about having these different voices in the classroom. And I've been so fortunate in many ways to have two cohorts. Um, and I've been working as well full time, so it's, a, it's very busy, um, but it's been amazing to have two cohorts from so many different um, countries and cities and backgrounds, some professionals, some just coming out of um, their, their bachelor's degrees and bringing those voices into the classroom to discuss these kind of challenging and critical topics. Um, so for me, that's been really important. And a, and, a, and a really big selling point in some ways of IGP. Um, another couple of things that I've kind of worked on, currently I'm working with one of the professors, um, Jackie McGlade, um, who you will probably end up meeting in one of your courses or um, as a guest lecturer. And she currently lives primarily in Kenya and she runs um, what's called ProCall Africa. And so IGP has quite a few different international initiatives where there's active research taking place within communities that then feeds back into IGP. And some of the students can also kind of jump into some of that research. You do it from London, but you do get to engage. And so we are looking at um, and have been actively putting together a carbon calculator for the IGP. Um, and the point of this, obviously, is to look at our own emissions, um, what we as a as a cohort, so as students, the staff, the administration, the buildings, so you're looking at the infrastructure, what the entire emissions uh, of IGP activities are, and then being able to offset that um, with ProCall Africa, with Jackie based in Kenya. And so she's working directly with farmers um, that are planting avocado trees and really regenerating entire ecosystems 
in Kenya around the Mao forest. She's doing an incredible, incredible job there and IGP is supporting it, of course, enormously. There's a startup that's happened there. So there's this innovation and entrepreneurship, which is tied in with what the IGP has already done. And then we get to kind of work on this calculator that then will also, you know, contribute to being able to offset the emissions, but also critically look at what IGP is emitting. So come up with transition plans. So it's this whole ecosystem and it's really, really interesting. Um, some of the other things I've written, I've written some notes. Um, another thing actually that IGP is really great at and which I took part in. So this is an optional, um, an, an optional piece is there's something called Base KX and it is the entrepreneurship and innovation hub. Um, of IGP or of, of UCL and as a student you have access to some of the workshops that they do about entrepreneurship how to start a business how to write a pitch how to kind of look at your financial statements so there's there's a huge amount of opportunity that kind of exists within IGP um, and you really just have to like grab it and take it and, and and move forward with it at your own pace and with what you want. So um, I would definitely say that joining this program, it's really about what you put in, what all of the students put in, um, and that's what you're going to get out of it. So what you put in is what you get out. So there's a lot of reading, there's a lot of critical thinking, there's a lot of reviewing case studies and looking at the world in a different way, um, using that kind of critical lens to to, to to rethink how the world works and how it can be how it can be done better. Um, so that's kind of my intro and I will take questions at the end if anybody has any questions. Thanks, Lydia. Um, Duncan is gonna speak to you about um, some opportunities and resources you can use. Yeah, so hi everyone. Yeah, I'm Duncan and I'm the program manager for the Institute for Global Prosperity. So I manage all of the you know uh, cogs um, and wheels, if you like, behind all of our the three masters programs that we offer. Um, so you're probably um, all I'm sure maybe even some questions have already been posted, but you're probably maybe all wondering about the process of getting here. So uh, you've heard all, all about the actual courses themselves, but yeah. So I thought um, I'd help provide some of that. So just very very briefly, um, we obviously apply through our um online through our website um a key date for you all for those of you who haven't applied yet is the 30th of june so that's our cutoff date for um applications so everything needs to be in by that date and that includes um sort of uh you know clearing things with referees and everything so the, my advice would be don't leave it until the last day because um quite often students then, then end up missing the deadline. So, so 30th of June have in your mind, but think maybe a month ahead of that uh, before, you know, to, to start uh, at the very latest to start applying. Um, and then uh, thought I'd introduce maybe a few, again, questions may have already come in, but a, a few scholarships and funds that might be of use to you. Um, I think Amanda is going to post a couple of links in the chat for us. Amanda or Ricky, um, but yeah, there's we have a few internally at the IGP, um, but then there are a few uh, wider ones within within our wider university. So one uh, specific one that we have uh, in our uh, uh, department in the IGP is the IGP Equity Fund, which provides two five thousand pound tuition uh, fee uh, grants uh, for the year. So two, two lucky people get that. Um, a deadline for that is the 31st of um, May, uh, 2023. Um, and then we have a faculty wide one, uh, which is a wider scholarship, a much bigger one, which covers all tuition and living allowances. Um, and that's for 10 uh, lucky people every year. The deadline is the same, the 31st of May. Um, and there's one important thing to say about that is you can't apply to these funds until you have an offer from, from us uh, to come and study. So that's where you have to start thinking about not the 30th of June date. If you want to go apply for funding, you have to think about having your application in and giving us like a good month to be able to review it um, for you to then start applying to these kind of funds, deadline of which is the 31st of May. So 
yeah so it, it gives you a bit of a, a timeline of when of when you need to get things to us so really you know you want to be thinking now about applying if you haven't already um and yeah that's a sort of overview of the process through the website deadline deadlines funds that are off, uh, open to you the links that i think have been posted in the chat uh, now i can't quite see uh, one uh, one is to our individual uh, fund within the uh, igp and then ucl has a wider scholarship uh, finder which is very useful and if you put your details in there it can open up dozens of funds other funds that are available to you within uh, ucl and also externally so uh yeah that's sort of a general overview of things um and i'll leave it there because i'm sure i might be able to cover some of the q a uh, things but yes uh thank you thanks duncan um so we're gonna do a q a first um and aminda do you wanna um read those off and one of us can tackle them Yes, so I'm going to read the questions, um, and we already have a lot of questions right now. So I'm going to start um, with the first question. So two people actually asked this, and I'm going to pass it over to you, Ida. What's the difference between the prosperity people and planet versus the general master and the global prosperity? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Um, it's a great question. So there's definitely a lot of overlap. Um, there's, uh, I think, a few differences is that um, the global prosperity program um, addresses a lot of these issues from a societal perspective. Um, and while PPP um, addresses them starting off from the environmental perspective and then going out, um, PPP will also focus, um, I think, a lot more on the whole system and making sure that although a lot of times we are starting potentially from the environment perspective, we will look strongly into how that then impacts all the other aspects of society and the economy. Um, and to make sure that we understand the whole system. Um, we also will focus a lot of PPP on solutions, um, including through the ATE, the Bob, the workshop course that Bob spoke about, um, and focusing on working with a community um, partner, um, whether it's an NGO, um, a government, um, a community, a borough in London, or a community in Africa um, about a problem they're having on the ground and how can we then help them solve it. Um, so very much about how you actually work towards solutions, what it takes to develop a solution. Um, so I think that's the thing. The other big difference, and it's a bit logistical, is that um, PPP will be based um, at UCL East, which is the new UCL campus opening up starting actually this coming September. Um, and so this will be, um, we've gone and visited and looked at sort of the building. It looks really cool. So um, UCL West, traditional, historical, amazing campus. Um, but it's those buildings have been around for a few hundred years kind of thing. While UCL East, they're just finishing construction. So very modern technology inside, very clean, very um, high tech, um, looks great. Actually, we went to visit a few weekends ago and it looks really nice so that's the other logistical difference and bob you wanted to say something well just another difference perhaps is i think we'll base a lot of what we do on um, the transdisciplinary field of ecological economics uh, which of which i was a uh, co-founder of uh, so we have that whole sort of intellectual uh, background uh, that we bring to and and also the global uh, sort of community of people uh, that are trying to do uh, economics and uh, uh, and natural system analysis, doing the whole system uh, kind of kind of analysis rather than just the, the economics of the market. So I think that that whole perspective is something that we'll bring to this program that will be a bit different, uh, perhaps in the uh, the global prosperity 
program, which like I said, have been uh, at least traditionally more focused on the, the, uh, the social side. And you already answered the question about UCL police. There was one a little bit further down about, about uh, uh, people wanted to know what UCL East campus was about. So I had already talked about that. And uh, <clears throat> that question also asked, how big will the cohort be? Do you know the answer to that? Um, let Amanda go through them, Bob. <laughs> okay. No worries. So um, thank you. That's really clear. I hope that answers Julia and an anonymous attendees um, question. My next question would be pretty related with your explanations on a course. So um, about the research methods content, will these be traditional qualitative, quantitative methods, stats, et cetera? Um, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, some of them will be, and you know, you, you're in a master's program. Um, some of them, you have to know some of the basics. Um, qualitative and quantitative methods used out there. So there's no getting around that. Um, but I think, as Bob mentions, we are using ecological economics as sort of the core interdisciplinary field. And with that also comes some different methodologies. So um, we'll spend some time on scenario planning and how do you actually run the process of creating scenarios and working with the community around scenarios. Um, we'll spend some time looking as system dynamics modeling and how do you build a model and what can a model do in the future um, so i think yes we'll cover some of the traditional methodologies i think we have to um, but i think we'll also cover some of the more unique methodologies um, that can potentially be used again to bring in that whole system perspective and um, whether it's scenario planning or envisioning or modeling or a few others um, those yeah some methods we plan on using thanks i don't know if bob you want to add anything no that was good yeah, sounds amazing so i'm going to direct the next question from the same person to lydia so do you need to have a dissertation proposal in mind before starting the course? And I know you are approaching dissertation period after this. Um, so I'm wondering if you already had like some ideas to, before you came in, to the IGP. Um, yeah, I mean, great question. And the, I mean, the kind of short answer is no, definitely not. And actually I would recommend not having something set in your mind because you need to have an open mind here, right? The whole point of this course is to learn is to expand your thinking, is to, again, critically think about challenges and issues that you see, right? And that's, again, that's the brilliance of having this diverse group of people is something is really relevant to one person that another person, it isn't relevant for. They've never thought about it. It's not a challenge that they've ever noticed. Um, and so your thinking will develop as you're in the program. And then you'll start to think to see where your interest really lies, like what is really making you tick, what's really um, kind of drawing you in. And that is where you'll then kind of decide what you want to do. So for me, I, um, you know, I do come from this kind of really different background um, where I've worked professionally for many years. Um, and I, so, so that kind of shapes a lot of what I've been learning because I had this experience. Um, and through that, I then kind of decided, okay, here's how I think I want to apply my thinking in my dissertation. Actually, Ida is my, is my supervisor in this. Sorry for all the emails. Um, Ida is my supervisor. And so she's also been really instrumental in helping me kind of like filter down and think, okay, is this going to work? Is it not? Um, and my dissertation topic is encompassing a lot of different industries, but looking at something very specific within sustainability, whereas a lot of the other cohorts from last year, um, and as well this year, they kind of went down more specific routes. So one person worked with a wetlands group and looked very specifically at a particular type of organism within the wetlands group and how this was interacting with the entire ecology of the wetlands and things like that. Um, another student of Bob's actually um, looked at coming up with a different prosperity index for um, for 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 the where he was from for his country and um, how that can be applied in doing a total data analysis. So and some people are really quant focused and some people are qual focused in terms of their research style. Um, so definitely, I would say keep an open mind with your dissertation 
topic for sure. Amazing. Thank you, Lydia. I totally agree. I am from last year's cohort and I came with an idea in mind be just before I came to the IGP, but I totally agree with Lydia that you should have an open mind then because IGP will tell you so much. And then as Ida mentioned, um, the research methods are really unique and it's not only qualitative and quantitative. So yes, keep an open mind. So um, the next question is also for Lydia. Um, how do you balance a part-time master's while working? How many contact hours do you have per week? I was a little bit of scared of this question. I saw this coming. Um, <laughs> And actually, Amanda, you'd be able to kind of give a different insight on this because you were full time. Um, I how do I about how do I find balancing? It's busy. OK, there's there's no there's no way to sugarcoat that. It's a lot of it's a lot of work. Right. This is a master's degree. This isn't it's not a bachelor. So you really need to invest yourself. You need to invest in the readings. You need to invest in the thinking and the activities that you need to do. You need to show up for class, not only because if you don't show up for class, you won't pass the class and you won't pass, you know, <laughs> you, won't, you won't actually succeed in this program, but also because you miss out on so much of the learning if you're not physically in the classes. Um, so for me, so the, the part-time structure is slightly different than the full-time structure. So you have your core modules kind of spread out through terms over two years. So your contact hours will vary based on that. Um, I'm on campus for th usually about three half days a week. Um, and I juggle, which is, is very difficult. I juggle um working while I'm on campus engaging in classrooms and with my cohorts and everything while also being in classrooms and cohorts and doing everything my evenings are and weekends are mostly about kind of reading catching up with things um you know I managed to have a social life which I know is very important to everybody but you you have to really kind of um, apply yourself and decide that you're going to succeed here and and contribute um, and a lot of it really is about that kind of contribution to classroom discussions. And you can only contribute if you've really invested in what you need to be doing. Um, so so there, that's one side. I will also say, I mean, so I work within sustainability. That's um, I work with um, one of the charities, one of the world charities here in the UK. And we focus on the finance community and on sustainability and how finance can drive sustainable change um, and actually helping helping financiers or CFOs and board members transition their thinking to sustainability. And I will say that because I work in the industry, it also really contributes to my own learning. So I get to apply my work to my learning and I get to apply my learning to my work. So I'm very lucky in that. And I think if you're going to work, um, try to find something that you're ultimately going to want to do because it really, really helps um, for me personally with my learning. I'm learning so much at work that maybe I didn't know at school and I'm learning so much at school that we don't talk about at work. Um, and I bring that into the classroom and I talk with other students about it. Um, but it's definitely a lot. Um, and there's there's great resources at UCL to help you with all of that. So you'll have student advisors and there's mental health um, support as well if you're feeling really overwhelmed and the school's really great if you need an extension, um, you know, which I've had to do a couple of times because we have huge deadlines at, at work and there's just no way that I can kind of meet up with that. But pre-planning is really important. So knowing what's coming up um, and, and planning ahead so that you have the time that you need. Amazing. Thank you, Lydia. I think it relates to Julia's question. She asked, how did you like the part-time modes of the program? And then you said that you can implement what you learn in class to your work and vice versa. So I think it's really great. Um, I assume you liked it. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's um, there. There's pros and cons. I, I look at the kind of everybody who's been doing full time, and they've really gotten to take advantage of everything at UCL. And I have as well, but not in the same like intensity um, and volume uh, because I have commitments that pull me elsewhere. Um, and in some ways, I think the full time cohorts are closer knit cohorts. Like as like you, you're spending so much more time with everybody, and you know. Bear in mind as well that master's degree are very much there's very much about networking you need to meet everybody here because this is going to be your you know your future colleagues um in the world wherever they are um and so that's one of the kind of drawbacks of being a part-time student is you don't get to be there 
as much as you'd like to. But again, there's an element as well, which I really have enjoyed being a part-time student because I've gotten to be, you know, be part of two cohorts and also see the development of IGP because IGP is growing and developing. And this is a new program that we weren't, you know, that wasn't around last year. And, and Ida and Bob have come along um, kind of midway through last year and then this year. And um, so I've gotten to spend time with them and they're amazing. And, um, you know, they're, it has its it has its pros and its cons um definitely but this has been my this is just how i've had to do it amazing um yeah my experience i was a full-time student um and i already feel that it was a lot um i don't know i may be more of a nerd type well i kind of like read all the time um because i'm not that you know, my, my reading pace is not that fast. And then when people spend time socializing, I was at home reading basically. So it really depends on how, you know, how ambitious you want to be in your class. But I think it's my cohort, like my cohort experience was also really great. So I would suggest to balance don't read all the time because London is amazing and you'll experience a lot with your cohort. Um, yeah, yes. And just quick question about the classes you have. Is it during the week or do you have anything weekend? We don't have anything weekend, right? And how many people, like, do you have many friends who are doing part-time as well versus the full-time? So there's not many part-timers. Um, last year, there were only a few of us, three of us, I think, and we've kind of drawn into this year. Um, and I think there's probably maybe three to five. I don't know, Duncan, you might be able to answer that better. But um, there are, I mean, there's also, I met a part-time student this year on an event on campus and I hadn't met him last year at all. So there's also been some part-time students, I think that like are very scarce. So they really don't come around very much. Um, that's not been my choice. I want to be actively involved. Um, but there's, there's, not as many part-time students as there are full-time because it's an intensive one-year master's where you get it all done and you're like fully immersed you're talking about sustainability you're living sustainability you know you're really kind of looking at these overarching issues so that it is meant to be an immersive and full-on one time you know one-year master's um yeah, yeah just Great. to jump in yeah our num the number of part-time students across the whole uh, department is very small uh, they they tend to be as well the um people who have already you know, had a bit of time working as well, because obviously a bit, maybe a bit older and also, you know, need to then balance other things. So yeah, quite often the part-time mode appeals to that, that kind of person. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's only a handful, um, but we encourage it. So, you know, if, if you're thinking about to them, please, please do. Amazing. Um, and while we're at it, I'm going to ask Dan, could Bafana's question, is there any specific funding available? I'm assuming she's or he is asking about part-time funding. Sure, yeah. So the the funds that I mentioned previously can are um, eligible to be pro-rated, which means you rather than getting the sort of full uh, amount at the beginning of year one, it would be spread across uh, your, your two years here. Um, and then, yeah, through the, the wider um, scholarship finder link that was shared, um, you'll find, I think, even there's a way to sort of click in sort of part time and all kinds of things. So uh, you'll, you, you'll likely find uh, other lots of other things um, within UCL, but also for further afield, which, um, yeah, you, 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 that would be, would be relevant to. OK, thank you. Um, and. I'm not sure who I can ask this for, Duncan or Aida, like the question, how big will our cohort be? So let me take a stab at it and then you can correct me because I might not get it right. Um, our cohort will be probably around 30, 40 um, students. But um, the cool thing is that, so IGP currently has three programs oh, or will have three programs. It has two programs now, plus PPP is starting. So it's Global Prosperity is one. Um, the Entrepreneurship, which I don't remember the full title, of, but the Entrepreneurship Program um, degree is another, and then PPP will be starting. 
Um, and the entrepreneurship program is actually moving to East Campus as well, starting September 2023. Um, so even though the cohort will be 3040 at PPP, um, a lot of the sessions, especially the dissertation sessions, um, some of the side events will happen in UCL East with the entrepreneurship program and then one week one day a week all the students will be asked to go to ucl west and then engage with the global prosperity cohort as well so um it'll be 30 to 40 probably for most things and then um probably about 70 80 of you um, at ucl east um, and then out to about 120 30 when the whole group igp group gets together so it'll be multiple levels duncan how did i screw it up you you did very well there, there more or less yeah um maybe add on in the bigger groups maybe add on another 10 or 20 students okay. um, across the whole uh, so about 150 people. total yeah, but um, yeah, for, for okay. this specific program, 3040, um, because yeah. it's the first year, we're, we're just not entirely sure um, how many people will come, but that's what we're, we're, we're planning for. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to I, either Ida or Bob. Is there any case where students actually participate in the project by going to locations outside of London? Yeah, um, definitely, actually. So um, if you are interested in doing some work on the ground outside of London, there's definitely opportunities. Um, you will have to get involved and make an effort to get involved in other things. So um, in the past, there's been students that have, for example, gone to um, Kenya um, based on research grants that faculty had, um, and so they got students involved in that. Um, also, there's a research grant that IGP has in Lebanon right now, so students have, have gone to Lebanon um, with that grant um, if they get involved in that research project. Um, the workshop will be running um, that Bob mentioned. Um, it might be um, with a London community, but it might be with an overseas or an international community. So that might also bring opportunities. Um, also keep in mind that you're choosing the topic of your dissertation. So you could also choose to do your dissertation on um, a community or something going on somewhere else in the world and go visit for that reason. So um, there are opportunities. Um, you have to basically say, I'm interested in these opportunities. How do I get involved? That will give me the possibility. So, um, Bob, do you want to add anything? I think I think you covered almost all of it. Um, um, so I think we should move on. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to ask a related question about it. Um, so, can students choose the problem and stakeholders to work with, or do you have a predetermined list of organizations and projects? So, maybe, maybe I'll take that one. <laughs> Okay. Well, in our in our workshop based atelier course, um, I think we don't have a predetermined list. Um, we would be looking for uh, projects that would be different every every term. Uh, so we um, you know, that that would vary from uh, from year to year. Um, and I think for your dissertations, it's the same the same thing. It's it's really up to you to choose uh, what your stakeholders that you would like to work with. Uh, we do encourage, I think, the sort of co-production idea that that the best kind of research these days is not purely academic, uh, but that engages with the the, uh, the people that have the problem, uh, and that that's going to end up with a much uh, more useful, uh, you know, and and I think more more unique kind of uh, kind of product. Ida? Okay, Ida, you, you want to add that? I, yep, I think Bob covered it. So just somebody put in, we will meet at UCL West once a week. Um, yes, there's a lot of activities that happen at UCL West 
IGP, um, the main office will be at UC, UCL West, the director seminars at, are you, at UCL West. So I think the idea is, and I this hasn't been completely confirmed, but the idea is that um, we won't make you, there won't be any classes at UCL East that day, um, but all activities you're expected to be at will be at UCL West for you to go out there at least one day a week. Um, again, that might change and we might kind of rearrange that there's no activities at UCL West, but I think it'd be good um, to kind of get you involved in the main campus with the other cohort and so on. Um, so that that was the thinking behind having you go to UCL West at least one day a week. And I don't, I don't think anybody else in the world calls it UCL West. That's they call, true. <laughs> they, um, call, they call it Bloomsbury campus. That's, but... that's true. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, so we're um, both Bob and I are quite new to UCL and UCL East was already a thing when we joined. And so it made sense to me to start saying UCL East and West. Um, most people don't know what I'm talking about when I say <laughs> UCL West. <laughs> so fair enough. Oh, yeah, great. Um, I think there's a question about, I'm going to ask this, um, optional modules. So I think that could be an opportunity for them to go to UCL Bloomsbury for their optional modules. But do you have any information about what optional modules they can take and where can they find information? Um, that's a Duncan question. Yes. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, we're currently just sort of finalizing all of that. Uh, so we we can't give you any concrete information right now, but that will all go live on our website very shortly in April. So um, yeah, you'll get all of that information um, afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I am, I'm also aware there may be lots of other questions that may relate to stuff to do with the, you know, things that I might be able to put on. So, for any that I maybe haven't got around to, uh, you are more than welcome to email uh, our inbox and then I can follow up with you separately um, about, about specific things as well. Um, and Amanda, if I could ask you just to do the IGP email, that'd be great, yeah. You just did. Okay, um, I just have one last question and then I will finish it off. Who, who should apply for the PPP program is, um, maybe this question would be more elaborated, like, do you think fresh graduates without prior experience could benefit from this program or this is something that would be more valuable to professionals? I think it's great for both, to tell you the truth, because um, as I mentioned, you know, we're not trying to teach you. There will be skills throughout it. You will definitely learn. But the idea is we're not teaching you a specific discipline that you'll then go and go, okay, I have to do this job with it. We're trying um, to teach you um, how to think about the world differently, how to kind of see the world as a whole system and what skills you will need to do that. And so whether you're a new graduate or you've worked in the world um, for a bit, um, I think everybody can use to see the world a bit differently. Um, and so after that, that's why you'll be able to pick up a lot of different jobs after this because it'll be applicable in very different ways. So Bob, Lydia, do you either want to say anything? Um, yeah, I think the world is changing and it's changing rapidly. And I think we want to make it change for the better not and not for the worse. And I think in order to do that, we do have to start uh, thinking differently. And I think those are the kind of skills and ways of looking at the world that we're that we're trying to to uh, to talk about in, in this program. And I think they they will make you um, more valuable in in a whole range of different contexts uh, because we're not saying apply the old tools you know that that come from the some the separate disciplines. We're saying think about what the problem is, you know, from a comprehensive, more systems perspective, and then think about what kind of methods, tools, you know, would be most appropriate to solve that to solve that problem. And if there aren't any, then let's come up with some new ones uh, that that combine, you know, things that that might be out there. So I think you'll learn how to be more a more creative problem solver, basically, which I think is what um, which everybody, all sectors 
uh, in in the world need need more of these days because we certainly have plenty of problems to solve. Okay, great. Um, now, with that being said, I'm going to turn it back to Ida. Uh, sorry for running over, and then. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Um, thank you all very much for joining, and thank you to Bob, Lydia, um, Duncan, Amanda, and Vicky for um, joining to help make this happen. Um, and thank you all for participating. And we really hope to see your applications and see you here with us um, starting September 2023.